Welcome everybody to our fourth and last lecture of the Mashup series. My name is Kiki Dörmann and I'm working at the Witt School of Architecture in the Honors Design Studio together with Nabil Esser and Gustavo, Gustavo Tri, uh, Triana Martinez. Before we introduce Mark Frohn from FAR as today's speaker, we would like to thank the School of Architecture and Planning at Wits to host the series. In particular, the head of school, Professor Namdi Ellie and Patricia Theron for the general setup and Stephen Bloomberg and Anita Senseni for managing the CPD process. This lecture series has mainly been organized by, by Nabil Esser, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank him for all the work. It has been a most valuable contribution for the studio and the school. Um, the lecture series has been complementing a studio dealing with mixed use buildings with a strong residential component as a mashup of program people and their mutual performance, ultimately asking how will we live together? How would we like to? How will we have to? Who is we? And how will it be different depending on where we are? This is about the importance of context. Our guests have been invited because they are dealing with similar questions in their line of work, usually elsewhere. Today, it is our pleasure to welcome Mark Frohn from FAR, a practice of architectural design and research founded by Mark and Mario Rojas Toledo, a firm that operates from Berlin, Santiago de Chile and LA, hence naturally crossing scales, continents and contexts. Mark worked for OMA and with BNK plus Brandelhuber. He taught architectural design uh, at the RWTH Aachen University, CIRAC in Los Angeles and the Royal College of Art in London. He heads the chair for architectural space and design at the KIT Karlsruhe Institute for Technology. Mario worked for Oscar Niemeyer in Brazil and GMP in Germany. He teaches at two different universities in Santiago de Chile. On their website, they say one of the crucial interests being addressed in their work are the underlying deep structures at play in each new project, the legal and financial constraints, desires, power structures, and technological, ecological, material, and institutional frameworks that shape the built environment. FAR lets each building site become a testbed for the inherent formal pressures of these invisible yet highly present structures, opening the way for invention and play and new narratives to evolve. On a personal note, Mark and Mario studied at the same university in Aachen like myself, and we did share for a very short while a working space on the top of the School of Architecture. I just returned from Amsterdam. Mario, uh, Mark came from Rome and Mario was rendering like no one else at the time both preparing for thesis. This must have been 1999 or 2000. Since then, their work has evolved and it is a pleasure to see their conceptual thinking that underlies every project being sharply translated into the making of form through the use of particular material and materialities, literally and metaphorically. We welcome FAR and Mark Frohn at the Witt School of Architecture in Johannesburg. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kiki, for the uh, uh, very nice introduction. Um, let me know if there's any uh, technical glitches or anything, then I'll, 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 I'll stop and uh, we'll get it resolved. So, um, uh, yes, it was mentioned we're, we're based in Berlin, Santiago and LA. I'm currently in Berlin and, uh, and I will present a series of projects uh, uh, in two different locations uh, uh, on the South American end and the and the uh, German side of things. Um, and I'll start with a project that probably at first glance seems significantly smaller than what you in the in the uh, mixed use program uh, or the mixed use studio will be dealing with. Nevertheless, I do think that this small project uh, called the Wall House, the first one that we built close to Santiago de Chile, um, uh, is relevant for our work as it kind of brings up a couple of concerns on. Uh, on matters of housing and uh, residential work that uh, um, that we've since been working on. Um, and uh, we started with a very simple, uh, you know, imagine a large lot it's somewhere relatively rural. It's a strange setup. It's not uh, inner city site. Um, and um, and we were at the time like uh, uh, considering actually uh, we were questioning the the major elements of the house the the, the wall um, the, these things that separate the inside and the outside and instead of actually having this one harsh division of being indoors or being outdoors 
uh, something that as to me seemed relatively inappropriate for the climatic condition that we found there. Um, we said actually we would start to, as you can see on this series of models here on the model shots, we would actually split the walls apart into a series of different performative layers uh, in between which the different spaces of the house would slip. And I will walk you from the inside of the house to the outside through these different layers or climate zones um, as they perform very differently, have very different atmospheric qualities and so on. So we start at the very center, um, <clears throat> at, the, at the very heart of it, uh, uh, the, at the core, um, and that core is the most private uh, uh, zone you can't look into very much and it contains the bathroom and at the same time it's also it's a concrete core and at the same time it also stabilizes the house in a heavily earthquake driven uh, uh, environment. So you see the photo of that very uh, contained and private uh, inner core. The second la uh, layer, the structural shelving, is something that um, uh, 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 that is the second layer. It, it both is the key structure of the building, and at the same time, it's, it contains something um, that, especially in modern times, in the house that don't have attics and basements so much anymore, you know, like flat roofs and uh, set easily on the soil, which is the storage. And uh, so this, these shelves actually contain all these private things that, that shape an environment, make it yours or ours or someone's. And so it's a very simple and primitive construction you know, in a sense. It's plywood and uh, these form boards that you use for the pouring of a concrete structure. So these are being used as very cheaply and easily available materials. And together with a certain amount of beams, it, can, uh, it creates a, a, a rigid structure for the two-story house. You can see it here, a view uh, through the kitchen to the outside. You can get a sense of how that uh, how that shelving becomes something that makes that home very personal. Everything that you own becomes something that you exhibit in a way as part of your life and your world. On the upper floor, you see from the outside to that core, the first element are presented. And again, you see the structural shelving as a key element uh, uh, in the spatial definition of the interior. The third layer is the milky shell. Um, it is like something that probably would come closest to what we would consider an environmental barrier of the house. You know, it, it, that separates where the rain comes in and where rain stays out of. Um, it's a, a translucent polycarbonate uh, 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 sheathing um, on a regular kind of uh, metal C channels that are used for uh, uh, drywall construction normally. And uh, you can see this crystalline shape um, that is uh, that constitutes that third layer. So you can see it here again. It's pulled away from the last layer, which is the shelving you see on the right here. So in that photo, you see three of these layers: the bathroom core or the, the central private core, the shelving, and the translucent skin. And every time again, they create different climate zones and inhabitable spaces in between them and amongst them. In certain specific areas, such as the living room, the translucent polycarbonate is replaced by a glass surface. As you can see on this one, you can open on a large scale. And actually, the, the next layer kind of emerges, the next and final layer, which is a uh, fabric that spans over it and creates a certain degree of shading. So that fabric is something that um, and now different geographies of our work come in. It's like something that is very characteristic of that part of Germany that uh, that A, I am from and that B, like I went to school at because there's a lot of these greenhouse construction. It's a fabric that's normally used, used for, for uh, extensive, um, I wish an echo. Um, it's used for uh, 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 the, the growing of, 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 of plants. Um, so that spans over the whole building, creates the shaded uh, area that's also free of, or like only has a limited, you know, um, uh, bugs and uh, mosquitoes in it. So you have an exterior zone that actually suddenly becomes inhabitable in a relatively sunny and at times harsh climate. So you can get a sense here, you're in between the outermost two layers of the house. But at the same time, so now, the, now that we've taken apart the, the, the most fundamental element, let's say, in, in, in the production of architectural uh, residential space, the wall and separated into a series of performative and atmospheric layers. Now we're looking at it from the outside, you can actually see that kind of staggering or separation of these different layers. And the interesting part to me also becomes the fact 
that during the different times of the day, the house develops a very different kind of appearance. You can see during the day, there's a little bit you see through, there comes a twilight time of the day where the outer fabric almost appears white, or the further you move to the night, the house then suddenly becomes transparent and like some of the inner guts suddenly become visible on the outside. Uh, and and uh, one aspect was, I mean, as as much as we could work in a very um, on a very limited budget, but also in the same way with in a very simple way of construction. I mean, we were working, um, uh, uh, and that was something very distinct from the environment that we knew from working as an architect in Germany. Suddenly, most of the people working on the project were not trained, or neither one of them was a trained. Uh, craftsmen. So you have people would normally come to mow your lawn, and they they would suddenly be the ones that start to help you on construction, you know, building some formwork and the like. Which so we detail the whole house in a very kind of rudimentary way that would allow us to kind of work uh, uh, with uh, with untrained uh, 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 an untrained crew. The only exception to that was actually the structural framing, the structural shelving, because in an earthquake zone uh, of like uh, or serious earthquake zone that Chile uh, is within, um, that had to be of uh, uh, there had to be extreme rigor applied in kind of both thinking, planning uh, and assembling this. So we uh, we built, like as you can see on the model, one of the pieces of the structural shelving, which we then had prefabricated in a furniture factory um, locally in Chile. And now you see it pre-assembled to test it uh, in that factory, the upper floor uh, that you probably recognize. And again, um, uh, there's an economy at play, um, something that you would never design the same way for a project in Germany, and we'll see that later as it works very differently. But uh, manual labor was very cheap, and on the other hand, this kind of infrastructure of a mobile crane was very expensive and therefore limited to the absolute minimum amount of, of time that we would have to rent it. You see the wooden structure up, um, of the, so the, basically the second layer, uh, the third layer of the polycarbonate being applied on these traditional seed ch channels that like pretty much anybody can assemble. They're like very basic. You don't need specific training for it. And they're the one, the, the elements used in drywall construction, as I mentioned before. And uh, this is the side of construction where the uh, where the fabric layer was tailored. Um, uh, and so this is like one of the construction crew uh, building the house here the time. Um, there's something strange. I mean, we designed this house for a very specific climate, for a very specific site. Um, there's a certain narrative that I'm that I didn't go into right now, but based on which I, I, I considered this kind of layer breaking upon, uh, apart the wall and layering it uh, kind of developed quite naturally to me out of the specific local conditions. But Nevertheless, like the project got published quite quite a bit, and suddenly it appeared in in, in context quite um, quite separate from the one that we had originally considered. So this is a Land Rover advertisement from Russia. Um, the house in the background, even though we never painted it, but like appeared uh, pretty much as 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 we knew it. Even the dog and the girl in the front, they appear in one of the photos that was published. Uh, and so here we are. Uh, and so shortly after the um, the Land Rover advertisement appeared in, in a Russian pub, uh, uh, magazine um, that by, just by coincidence we we heard of um, this house was built in Japan. Uh, the left half of which seemed strangely familiar to us. Uh, not so much the right uh, uh, right wood clad part. Nevertheless, so suddenly there is something of a global economy, kind of an architectural economy, kind of meeting a project that seemed at first glance to us when we worked on it so specific and so local. We started to rethink our own approach to it and figured out actually maybe we didn't design just a single project for a very specific client in a very specific site, but instead actually designed a building system, something of a climate onion, you know, different layers on top of layers. And if you would abstract it in that way, we could also say, hey, um, that is something without our full involvement that could be adjusted and developed further and reappropriated in different contexts and climate zones. And 
So we put a website online, mywallhouse.com.net, uh, I think, or yourwallhouse.net, yes, that was the title, where we basically sold for a relatively uh, 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 low price the, the right and the drawing package uh, based on which any client or local builder uh, uh, could uh, reappropriate and take the project further. With the sole intention from our end, not so much to monetize it, but actually uh, uh, something that was included in contract that we, we would get photos or would be able to take photos of the new project in a way to kind of document that further development and um, also to also see something that we have a hard time with as architects to let loose and lose control on one's own kind of initial kind of thinking. Um, so, um, I think we sold two of them. It wasn't exactly a huge success, but it was also like something of a conceptual reckoning on our end, I feel. Um, so now from, from, from the Wallhouse project, we jumped quite a bit in terms of, of timing. Um, uh, uh, and uh, but we stay in the Santiago de Chile region. Uh, this is the uh, this is like uh, uh, the blanked out zone that is the metropolitan area of Santiago de Chile, and all the red dots are uh, large scale uh, so, or la larger scale social housing projects. Uh, and social housing projects in Chile means uh, they're not, and that's opposed to the model that we have here in Germany, where social houses rental space. These are units that these new owners actually uh, purchase uh, with a, uh, under very uh, um, favorable conditions um, financed originally by the state. What becomes very apparent, though, here looking at that diagram is there is plenty of them, you know, in the periphery, let's say, of that urban, larger urban zone or um, uh, metropolitan zone. But like the whole central part is completely devoid of any social housing. And that obviously has to do with a simple, very basic fact, which is property or land is too expensive normally. So the only way, uh, but but at the same time, I deem it quite important also to think of social housing not just to provide four walls and a roof, but at the same time also pr provide some sort of a spatial relationship to both techno technical and social infrastructures. Um, uh, many of which in the setups of Santiago are also still centralized. So the the, the question is then, um, uh, 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 oh, outside our work, but like also for for the agencies responsible for the social housing, what opportunities there were to build such work of larger scale social housing in the inner districts of Santiago. A uh, quick jump um, to, to address that question. Um, uh, this is a uh, this is a photo from a um, from an artwork um, called Odd Lots by um, Gordon Mata Clark, an American artist. Uh, actually, strangely enough, uh, coincidentally of Chilean roots. Um, but what he did in New York in the 70s, he bought these really uh, strange pieces of land. Um, very uh, that's also where the title "Odd Lots" come from. So, like you know, for example, something of that little triangular black one here, uh, uh, not with any street access. Uh, he he basically purchased quite a few of them. That's a catalog of the pieces of land that he purchased. None of them had any economic potential. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, so um, he and, and part of the exhibition became the title uh, titles and the documentation of uh, of the paperwork of this project. Anyway, so that being said, there was something. Um, if any lots, if any, there was any possibility for the development of a larger scale social housing in that part of the of the metropolitan area, it would only be those odd lots in a way, odd, or uh, odd lots of that sort that were uh, kind of uh, of no interest for the larger uh, 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 real estate market uh, so that the prices would actually be low because there is no further kind of um, value in, in any other way. And that brings us to this very lot that we've been uh, working on a project for now almost six years probably and it is finally under construction. Um, Martin Black is this piece of land or piece of property. It's like a, a little bit less than nine meters width in width and almost 100 meters long and, and perpendic set perpendicular to one of the main arteries uh, into the uh, central part of Santiago, a street called Santa Rosa. Um, 
And uh, as opposed to the last project, which started by the idea of actually taking the spatial boundary as the starting point of design and uh, thinking about space as not something that's contained by walls, but space that's something kind of being defined as climate zones or that vary in terms of atmosphere, climate, and, and, and um, let's say a degree of containment. Uh, here we had to work quite differently because what you get in this kind of bracket of social housing is a very strict catalog. And a catalog uh, that's being handed to you by the agents, public agencies or the public bodies that supervise the construction of uh, social housing, uh, catalogs of furniture and um, circulatory areas surrounding each piece of furniture. So basically, um, it becomes a strange kind of puzzle of this list of pieces that you have to provide for in certain amounts or, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, certain amount of beds and, and, and. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and it's a strange puzzling that ultimately leads to after, you know, hundreds and hundreds of rounds leads to like strange patterns such as that. Of, uh, of what areas are allowed to overlap, not allowed to overlap, what relationships between these furniture pieces are uh, to be uh, um, considered or uh, uh, not to be considered. And so at the end, you know, I'm showing that without the walls here, because ultimately it is that kind of patterning uh, and puzzling amongst these furniture pieces that drives that process or drove that process. In our specific case, um, we developed a unit type um, that was double story, so a mesonette kind of unit um, with all the kind of, let's say, shared areas, kitchen, dining, living on the lower level and these individual bedrooms on the layer level above. Um, and that had a very simple uh, reasoning also. Our lot was so slim that we had to provide like a, um, a linear a gallery like circulation and in order to kind of maintain a degree of privacy for the bedrooms we stacked them on top so that there was no interference in, in, interference between the let's say the, the, the circulation that neighbors would use and uh, and the kind of uh, uh, windows to your bedroom in a way so um, uh, what's also critical about it and that will be also critical in the context of one of the uh, the later two last two projects that i will show is that in this here uh, uh, social housing in that context means that all units are exactly the same in terms of their demands they all have the same number of rooms and the same number of spaces uh, allocated to different furniture pieces. It is not about a variety of conditions and ambitions of how we live and work in our home. So this is a longitudinal elevation of, of the building. So what you see basically you're facing that almost 100 meter long uh, kind of uh, along that 100 meter long uh, property, uh, a nine story building. Um, you can see always the two levels of uh, uh, the colored ones uh, is a level of circulation where it, it, the facades open on a large scale to the to the gallery circulation and the more enclosed kind of series of windows, windowed walls uh, for the bedrooms. In section, so we have a nine-story building which uh, alternates between a width of three and a half meters uh, uh, next to the circulation and four and a half meters roughly where the bedrooms are. So it's a very slim, almost like a wall, the whole nine-story wall ultimately. Um, in longitudinal section, um, it quite becomes like it's a, a super repetitive approach to it. Um, of uh, uh, ever two uh, similar apartments facing, mirroring one another um, and being stacked uh, two stories at a time. In plan, uh, on, the on the right, you see that main road, uh, Santa Rosa, the entrance to it, you have the this very slim uh, uh, building uh, facing or uh, uh, abutting to the property line on the bottom edge of the drawing um, in a firewall, so no windows on that side. Um, and you have that sequence of rooms in every second floor, as you can see here now, the gallery circulation with vertical circulatory um, uh, with staircases on the two ends and then elevator core in the middle. And again, the next floor is the bedrooms with no circulation and continues like that, you know, for nine floors total. Uh, this is a physical model of the whole building uh, uh, along the longitudinal site. Uh, you know, so the the two uh, the two stair uh, staircases up to the side obviously not not only connect everything vertically in terms of circulation, they're also critical uh, in terms of structural approach because like a nine-story building of three and a half meters width is not exactly kind of a um, 
um, simple task in an, in an earthquake environment. So considering that, they play a crucial role in stabilizing the building uh, next to kind of the circulatory role. But what you see is uh, the building is almost like a raw structure. Um, uh, it's not finished at all. It's like a it's, a, it's just a straightforward concrete building. And you see in the units themselves, then on the every second level where they face the gallery circulation, um, you see uh, as they're kind of fitted out uh, uh, according to private wishes, needs, and so on. And that becomes part of the visual appearance of the building. So there's always there's a play between this rigorous kind of sun shading white grill and uh, which in reality will be dark um, and this like very uh, heterogeneous kind of uh, 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 visibility especially at night of the interiors uh, uh, to which we haven't added anything other than the staircase to the second level. Again model shot that gives you an idea of that duality of the building and uh, a sense of how these gallery circulatory elements kind of are connected through the through the staircase on the two ends of the building. Zoom in. And again, I do think that the, it has a strong presence, uh, especially at night due to this like, you know, horizontal cuts of visible interiors and shut off interiors in a way. Uh, like a sense of the construction document. So you see what I mentioned before, it's a completely repetitive approach. A single, single unit being developed, or two units, the end units are slightly different, um, that is then mirrored and repeated time and again. And that is due to a very specific kind of set of rules that is uh, that's the basis um, that, uh, 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 that is necessary to fulfill uh, for the funding for that public housing. Um, and uh, this is the first time ever that uh, there is a multi-story or a kind of a um, seven to nine story um, public housing being built, uh, meaning also first time a, a, a social housing being built with an elevator. And one of the strange things that we encountered looking at reference projects in, of, of the social housing in Santiago was um, they are, as I mentioned before, they're not for rent, but they're, the units are then being owned by the, by the inhabitants. So there's initial public funding to get the building going, but there is absolutely no money for maintaining the property and maintaining, you know, the systems in it. And in our case, it would also entail the elevator. So, but it, it seems rather un, un, um, uh, problematic from our perspective to just put it out there in the world and then run away and then not care what will happen to it. Because you see it in many cases that actually, you know, uh, initially being funded and then uh, uh, and then there's nothing to upkeep the project. So since we on the backside had this massive um, firewall with no windows, um, we decided that would be actually a source of income, considering that Santa Rosa, that large road, the four lane, four lane major artery of traffic, um, uh, it's a one way street, all of them passing by this firewall. And so this will be uh, used as a large billboard. Um, doesn't have to be an American corporation that rents it, but anyway, anybody who is willing to pay there, and uh, that money is actually ultimately the funding for the upkeep of the uh, of the infrastructures of that project. So, the idea being that the design entails not only the moment of getting it off the ground, but actually also thinks of it as like something that's out there in the world for years or decades to come. You see uh, the site uh, is in this middle, a little bit below the, uh, like uh, from left to right in the middle, a little bit below the middle and top from top to bottom. It's a, one of these longitudinal sites and this is exactly how it looked last week. So as I mentioned, after six years of um, uh, a nail biting, uh, let's say nonsensical, partially nonsensical debates and, uh, uh, and holdups, uh, in various kind of um, bureaucratic uh, environments. Now, finally, it's off the ground and uh, uh, the construction is actually happening right now. But you get a sense also of the scale and the proportions of this lot. We're jumping, um, not so much in time right now, but we're jumping in terms of geography. 
I know, no, actually, it was one little, one more, and see, yeah, yeah, fine. Um, uh, before we jump, we, we stay in Santiago, and I show, show you um, one other project, one of the many ones uh, 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 that we work on and that never make it uh, in terms of being built. But it's interesting, it's also a social housing project, so same premises that I mentioned, the idea of the furniture puzzle and so on. But in this, in this case, while the first one that I showed you actually was very much about the kind of linked gallery circulations, kind of linking all the apartments. This one is, again, a two-story scheme, but in this case, uh, every unit uh, has uh, is paired, uh, every solid unit is paired with a void exterior space, so like a little bit of a garden terrace, something of that sort. So in that sense, it becomes a three-dimensional strange puzzle of uh, solid and void. Uh, uh, this approach obviously has something to do also with very different, let's say, uh, contextual constraints in terms of property dimensions, proportions, and uh, the heights of uh, how much we could build. It's a relatively complex site, as it turned out. So you can get a sense uh, of the units here shown in black and the uh, uh, interim spaces, uh, uh, each one being allocated to one of the units for lighting, but also uh, in terms of an exterior uh, uh, zone that's uh, dedicated to the unit. Um, and so you see that here in a physical and a working model early on. So it's like something that stacks up towards the street side with the larger scale buildings and it stays relatively low in the context of these single story kind of um, uh, uh, older kind of developments, some of them being light industrial in that, in that surrounding. Again, um, oops, uh, so I think I, that's a, a sequence of like different working models and you get a sense. Um, it's not like something that's just being outborn out of like one ambition, but it's like something that kind of has a long, long road of actually um, then kind of making it out. Uh, into the final form. So I'm clicking quickly through a sequence of the different floors from ground, ground floor upward. Um, and you get a sense uh, of what I described, the interior very, very compact two-story interior um, units and the uh, uh, being separated and buffered uh, through the exterior spaces in between. Second floor, so that's like where uh, many of the bedrooms are. Third floor, again, you see two major circulatory uh, um, arteries, let's say, uh, uh, from uh, top right to bottom left, uh, which is the key principle of circulation in the scheme. And again, the second layer, and you see how it stacks up further towards the street side. And ultimately, there's a series of photos. Um, then giving you a sense of that poor, very porous structure of very dense units, but then also these open spaces in between that help the daylighting and uh, give you private outdoor spaces for all units. Um, as I mentioned, this project um, most likely will not be built in that form. It has to do with the fact that uh, uh, the, real, the real estate market is uh, really difficult like in this and like um, as we were working on it, um, the city had like uh, issues with uh, one half of, the, of that property and it, it seemed to disappear not physically, but as an option for them to build upon. We make one larger shift from the, uh, from uh, uh, over the um, Atlantic, let's say, from from, from South America to, to Germany. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you uh, a one and a half more projects. Um, um, the one uh, that I'm continuing with is called the Wohnregal. And um, while like the two social housing projects in Chile, like they were built on the assumption that there is one unit, an it's assumption that we didn't make, but that we had to work with, um, an assumption that means, uh, that implies that um, there's one unit that fits all in a way. And um, uh, I mean, as in many other places in the world, uh, there is a huge, there is a significant housing shortage and almost a housing crisis in Berlin. Um, and uh, and that housing crisis has um, has brought up voices uh, or has has brought up the question again: Does it, if, if it wouldn't make sense to build in serial construction and in a way in modular building logics? 
Um, and uh, we've taken up that question uh, 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 for ourselves and like we by reappropriating a kind of serial uh, modular construction system of prefab concrete elements but we were wondering because there is not only the one issue that drives the kind of housing situation in Berlin meaning you know the need the dire need to build quick fast uh, fast and cheaply and therefore a kind of impl uh, the implication of serial production of architecture but like something that at first glance seems to contradict that um, very nature which is like an ever widening range of of ways of how people want to live to work or to live work especially now uh, uh, half in half post corona i guess so um, you know, uh, you know, while the serial construction or the serial design as we knew it uh, almost automatically implies also a seriality, a uniformity of of the unit, something we just saw on the Chile project. Um, uh, we thought if we couldn't kind of get beyond that and combine these two needs, the need for seriality and the need for a great variety of uh, of units that cater to an ever widening range of needs and wishes uh, and that's why we started to look at a, a way of construction that is not commonly used or not at all used in in residential work but that uh, uh, especially uh, uh, here in the in, in the con in the in the let's say um, uh, germany or central european context is actually being used for uh, uh, industrial warehouse construction and these are precast concrete elements, beams, columns, and so-called TT or pi ceilings. Now I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and these elements um, are then consolidated into, um, you know, warehouses normally. So this is like how it would look like an exploded uh, axonometry of a single floor of this building. And so from the wooden model that I just showed you, you could con see you could could you could uh, see then that we're actually talking morphologically speaking um, of a series of six stacked warehouses in terms of uh, this logic. Um, you see here um, uh, one of these elements that I was uh, 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 that I was mentioning next to the columns and the beams. Uh, that's a so-called uh, pi, like that uh, math mathematical uh, sign, or a TT ceiling, and that's a critical aspect that I'll get to in a second um, uh, uh, in terms of the construction uh, logic, but also about the conceptual idea of linking seriality to a maximum of freedom. Um, and you see like the factory or one of these factories that produce these pieces like um, uh, and this one being like somewhere outside Berlin an hour and a half from the city roughly. This is the site. This is the first day where pieces have been delivered. In that case, the columns are laying on the floor slab, on the ground slab. And uh, the context of that project is an inner city site, um, one site connected to the, um, let's say, more or less historic block structure. The actual corner lot had been uh, bombed out in the war and therefore um, now was uh, had not been built upon for, for decades and was now uh, open for construction. Um, so you see that the principle that I've shown you in the axonometry and the exploded axo just a moment ago, you see the columns, the beams, a few walls, not many, um, but you see actually that these pieces are puzzled together floor by floor. So the construction was like one week per floor for the for the raw structure. Um, so six weeks total for the six week structure and then came facade and interior. But the idea uh, well, I'll get to that. And, and, uh, but here you see like uh, then the, the, the connections thereof, but it always has been and it stays in this project, an industrial way of construction and not one that's super polished in terms of like an architecture, you know, with all the ambition of minimum seams and perfect polished surfaces. The surface is rough, uh, the seams are large. Um, but actually that breeds a specific architectural aesthetic um, and, and, and logic and uh, tectonic, which actually quite beautiful because if you, once you look at these connections from within the building, you see the light coming through these major gaps and almost seems that these like multi-ton pieces, you know, five, six, seven tons that they weigh, they seem to float. It's very strange. Never seen, I mean, never seen that before. And I think it's actually a very strange actually architectural language. For something like concrete that always seems like um, a, a material that is considered with uh, uh, um, you know that you build um, uh, um, you know that is that is uh, yeah solid in that sense. 
I think that photo tells you the conceptual premise best in a strange way, because uh, what you see is the long span of these ceiling pieces. You know, it spans literally in this building 12 meters from one end, from one facade to the next. And that's something really uncommon and it would in any other construction also be uneconomic or non-economical. Um, but you can see the really slim concrete edge in the front of that ceiling and then the thickening for whatever these down stands are. And that's actually what interested us in that very specific construction method, um, because that's actually uh, to, to us the one approach that allows the seriality with a maximum of freedom, because once you don't have any structural elements within the building itself, um, nothing uh, denies you of having different plans on every floor. Um, so. Um, uh, and the one element that allows for that kind of construction is that the, what you see here in a construction uh, sketch or drawing section that the so-called TT ceiling, two downstands and the slab on top. And that allows you, depending on how deep these downstands are, a span and technically up to 25 meters or whatever. Not that that's kind of reasonable for housing. But um, so in our case, it's more or less 12 meters. And so if I now click through the different plans, you'll see um, that on the first floor, second and third and fourth and so on, nothing matches the floor above or below. So like within a single building, within the economy of normal construction, are actually cheaper than normal construction, we were able to kind of have flats from 35 to 110 square meters. And it's not like a, a, something as a, a tour de force, but it's like something that comes quite natural in this way of construction. Um, you know, from single room studio spaces to large multi-unit, uh, uh, large uh, apartments with uh, a multitude of, uh, of flats. Um, while there's a difference on all, as I described, the difference between all the floors, there's also something that is very similar, you know, and that's especially on the right half or the, the rightmost section of that plan. It's like the part of the of the plan that is cold in quote, so that's not part of the interior. It is like uh, the staircase, the elevator core, and like um, a little balcony, let's say, of sorts for each of the apartments, because there's two units per floor. So two of these corner uh, corner balconies. So um, that's uh, uh, so that part is an exterior part. The rest then is uh, um, insulated uh, from the outside and uh, indoors. Uh, this is an unfold with a plan and uh, an RCP, a reflected ceiling plan. So imagine you fold them apart and it shows an overlay of the plants and interior walls of all different floors. And that's like something that would normally be nuts in a way. I mean, architecturally, I mean, almost anything is possible, but the question always is also about the rationale and if it makes sense in a way. But suddenly under this premise, uh, of the Wohnregal, meaning an uh, inhabitable shelf within which on every floor you can place different kind of plants and objects um, that suddenly became feasible. So uh, that X-ray view through different plants, I think, explains the, the premise and the possibilities of that way of thinking about residential work quite, uh, quite clearly. Uh, a couple of uh, exterior shots that help you to contextualize it. Um, you know, as I said, it's an inner city uh, part of Berlin, Moabit. Um, uh, um, and um, you see it's a corner lot. You see it uh, in the center of the photo and from the other end. But we opted not to close the traditional building block that uh, Berlin is like in terms of an urban morphology built upon. But we kept it open because this whole crossing, this whole zone is like, as I mentioned before, had been bombed out and is very heterogeneous. And so um, we found it rather reactionary to kind of go back to kind of a 19th century approach to kind of urbanism in this context. Um, what you see on the left is a north facing facade with the with the staircase and exterior staircase, the balconies you see on the corner and that close part is the elevator core. And it's relatively uncommon in Germany to have an open staircase in multi-unit housing. Uh, nevertheless, it is like a much cheaper approach, but it's also something that really animates that northern facade. Um, I think it actually works quite well as a place. Like so, suddenly there's like uh, it actually a feels very nice being in that staircase. You know, you have beautiful views from there, but it also animates the street instead of having just yet another blank facade there. 
Um, and one other element that's actually quite significant to understand this project, or you know, and also in, in the conception of it was very important, is these um, uh, uh, something that's normally not very common for residential work. Uh, it's like a um, curtain wall facade made of large sliding elements, which allows you, uh, depending on the climate of the time and the season, um, to open the the units, uh, the live work units. I mean, they're like live live work. Partly, many people also work in them, uh, uh, live and work. Um, uh, uh, so you can open them on a large scale, and um, and and therefore, especially in the spring and summer month, actually have a fresh breeze, so that the whole unit almost works as a large lodger, protected above but open to 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 a fresh breeze, a breeze. Um, I'll show you a couple of interior shots that give you a sense of what it means to work with this uh, with this way of construction, with these concrete elements, with these uh, downstands in the ceiling. But they also demonstrate what I described before that within the you know the repetitive logic of that uh, modular system, you have very different plans. And the best to show that is like the different kitchens in a way. So you have very um, very different layouts, uh, just like as if I go up and down the different floors. And um, here again, you see the transition from the inside to that corner balcony and the sliding doors that kind of allow you to open it up on a large scale to to the surrounding nature. I mean, you can imagine it's it is actually quite green in the summer surrounding it, and actually feels very nice uh, to sit indoors and have these open the these facades open to a significant uh, part. But then there is something else implied in the um, in what I would say uh, in, in in the serial um, approach to to construction and design because I mean you can say it's about the repetition of the pieces within this project so you know these you know the the these TT ceilings the beams and the columns and so on they they are multiple of the same. But I think that repetition also is something that is significant on another scale, meaning on the design scale. So you could argue the building is not a one off, but with this approach, it makes sense to design more than one project on a different site in a different scale, because one has to imagine there's, there was a huge amount of investment. I mean, in terms of research to kind of work with a system like that, because you really need to familiarize yourself with it. Um, uh, it's not something that you you quickly do so like we figured um together with the um that uh, with the developer um here from germany um uh, uh there was a, a a second project um that we worked on or still work on uh that is now started construction very recently um and uh, it's interesting uh, in, in multiple ways, A, because it is a very different scale, while the one I just showed you has like 10 units or 11 units, including the ground floor. Uh, this one has almost 130. It's that central one of the two parallel bars in the middle, but it's also uh, the context within which it sits. It is like one of these um, 1970s or 1980s East German uh, large scale housing developments, um, Marzahn Hellersdorf. Um, uh, and which have uh, uh, which have been built as serial prefabricated serially from prefabricated concrete elements. So it, it is in a way meeting our own architectural grandparents um, uh, or parents. Like, let's think of timing. So. Um, uh, but it's interesting in that because you kind of being contextualized suddenly by something that is uh, 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 conceptually similar, but at the same time is also very different because the idea of repetition or this, uh, the idea of seriality of these um, 70s and 80s large housing blocks, they are very much based also on the repetition of the unit. So you have like two or three different types of units. They're very well designed. Nevertheless, it is about uniformity all units the same. And the reason for that is like, for example, as you've seen in our project, it is a skeleton construction. So there's uh, columns and beams and ceilings, but within that you have a free condition or a very, uh, you know, free free range, let's say. Um, and the, 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 the surrounding ones, like uh, the, the serial elements are actually the walls. It's a very different inherent logic because the one creates repetition in terms of spatial condition and our create repetition in terms of structural logic, but spatially it is like relatively open. 
So this is side of the photo of the construction side. This is like one. I mean, this photo here you can see on the model. It's a, on the one on the top, that multi-story one. So that is like what I was referring to as this um, as 1970s, or in this case, early 80s, uh, 1980s um, East German housing construction, large scale uh, housing construction. So that's the context of the project. Uh, and so um, we're, uh, we're um, finding ourselves on the side where we uh, reapplying this logic that we've developed for the Wohnregal project for the last one I showed you, um, but on a vastly different scale. Um, and there is like the, the whole complex based on one plinth for a parking, and especially also bicycles and so on. And on top of that, there's two linear buildings opposing one another in terms of distancing and pro sectional profile, similar to like a traditional Berlin street, actually, that give, gave us a sense of what works in terms of daylighting and some privacy between the two sides. And these two linear buildings surround a, um, I'd say, a, um, uh, a shared garden plateau with playgrounds and uh, social infrastructures and so on. And these, as you can see here, that central uh, um, garden plateau has uh, is punctured at three strategic points to the level below. And you can see here the transition, like in, in that um, rendering here, the transition from that parking uh, bicycle level, let's say, to the uh, to the shared garden plateau. If you go up further, um, yeah. And go up further, then uh, there is, as, as also similar to the Wohnregal, not in, this, in the same fashion, um, there's a variety of different units. Um, it's again, it's the same principle of the superstructure and concrete and like all the fit in walls and so on and drywall construction. Um, in this case, the circulation works differently. It's, it's a gallery, uh, a linear gallery circulation with two staircases at each end. So it's similar to the Santiago project, the first social housing I was showing you. Um, but the one thing that actually differentiates and is characteristic for the project are these balconies, private balconies for each of the units that protrude into the shared, um, uh, uh, let's say, garden zone. Um, and they're characteristic both, let's say, uh, in, in the visual appearance of the building, but they do have a purpose in the sense that weight form allows each and every inhabitant on their balcony to actually also visually look out of that uh, linear space as you kind of get to that edge, the, the, the outermost protrusion of that waveform, suddenly you're able to look at out of this uh, uh, um, shared um, in between space because both of these ends are actually very green and it's a it's a quite beautiful view to one of the small um yeah river would be too much but like a little creek let's say um on one of the ends facing it uh frontally and so that is um and uh, i'm now also uh, coming to the end of um, my little presentation um uh, it is in a way uh, a continuation of the of the last project that I showed you in terms of the construction. Nevertheless, um, and typologically, uh, uh, it uh, plays also on some of the ideas of the of the first Santiago project with the linear circulation with double height units. Also here only on one on the on the first two levels, but it's like. Um, uh, something that develops ideas in terms of construction, a methodology, and circulation, and so developed in the different projects and, and consolidates them. Uh, that was it from my end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was uh, super interesting. Uh, puzzles, patterns, and possibilities actually really traveling, traveling across continents. Uh, also really interesting to see how the ideas um, develop th across the projects, you know, over time and and um, uh, while yet pursuing particular themes or thematics that that one, you know, discovers. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for for for. for doing this talk. Uh, I, I think what I, I just want to say thank you because uh, when, when we looked at your work, uh, Kiki and I, um, the, the, the interesting thing was for the students was this incredible conceptual clarity uh, in, in, in thinking the project and then making the project that that, that continues. And, and that's something we wanted to get across to the students. But, but today what's amazing uh, for me is uh, the, this idea of uh, um, 
uh, types uh, and, and the skit of parts uh, and organizational systems. Uh, so, mm-hmm. so, you know, breaking the, 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 the building thing into kind of these rational moments, uh, which I think is so, 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 so kind of important for uh, students. But my question is really not about the parts, but how this kind of rigorous thinking of yours spans two very different continents, very different conditions, uh, in my mm-hmm. mind, uh, us being in the South. Uh, and Johannesburg is kind of a strange place in that we deal with uh, a wide range of economies and, and types mm-hmm. of buildings. So, so we deal with fairly sophisticated, but fairly uh, basic, and, and our urgencies are extreme as well. But you seem to deal with it across continents in, these, in two ways, but you have a rigor that is the same. Uh, for the for the projects that are in Santiago versus the projects in Berlin, and and, and what what helps like like what's the um, what's the thing that makes uh, the this difference that you have of being in these two places or you know two partners or, or being in different places having a foot in both? Uh, mm-hmm. What 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 about Santiago or, or, or the thinking of those experiences makes Berlin more interesting? And what about Berlin? <laughs> Comes into mm-hmm. Santiago. That would be my question. I do think. I mean, it's a very interesting question, and like, it's like something. I'm. I'm I hope I can partially at least answer. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that fully because um, we've been thinking about that uh, ourselves for like more than 15 years now, and um, answers uh, uh, keep either evading us or keep uh, can keep shifting. But I think one important part is um, that we have always, from day one, being based in the different environments, physically and personally. We've been embedded, so that means wherever we work, um, being it uh, the European, the South American or the Northern American context, um, we are both insiders and we're outsiders. That means like um, we have an intricate understanding of um, of the economies, of the of the conditions, of what we're actually working with, what, what um, uh, 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 Kiki quoted as the deep structures because I do think it's critical, but at the same time, something that is also something sometimes paralyzing if you're constantly within that, um, uh, you kind of run blind in a way. So we, I do think we have a strategic advantage in that, like looking at those always at the same time from within, but also from the outside, which actually is quite revealing. Also, if you think about it, um, for example, and give you one example, the um, when you think, I mean, the 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 housing difference, like in a, in a way, becomes really apparent um, um, in the German context uh, nowadays. Uh, a, a building environment which is like highly driven, uh, I mean, as dark or boring as it sounds, but again, everything boring can be turned into something interesting. I mean, it's highly driven by, um, uh, by uh, how would you call that, um, uh, insurance issues, you as an architect. So, and, and the way liability, uh, uh, liability, I guess. Um, and, and, and suddenly, like everybody starts to work within systems, systems being determined uh, by companies. And with uh, at the moment, as long as you stay within them, you're fine. As the moment you kind of crossbreed them, you're in trouble because nobody takes responsibility for anything. So I do think in a strange way, we're like in a post-material kind of setup that we're working with, literally working within um how to combine different systems within within uh, within a building context? Well, for example, in Santiago, that is not a given at all. I mean, we traditionally think about: is it a concrete building? Is it a brick building? Or whatever. So, but like these things become very apparent suddenly once you you have to deal with both, and I think that helps you to sharpen uh, your view or sharpen your knives, however you call that. Like you get you you kind of. Um, get a more crisp understanding. Um, so I don't think why they are different, that difference is actually some, something that uh, becomes exaggerated with, with the two perspectives and it becomes something more easily uh, uh, dealt with, I think. So it's less a problem, but more an advantage in my eyes. I'm not sure if it answers your question, I hope. Uh, yes, it does, no, thank you. Thanks. Um, I saw Namdi, I'm not sure if he's still here, Namdi's hand was up. But I think he might have, maybe he just cut off, uh, maybe it hit him. Um, uh, Namdi? 
And yes. uh, um, Mark, thank you very much. I believe my question has been asked. This is uh, uh, a beautiful lecture and um, I am fascinated by the um, practice that spans two or more continents. Um, if it is possible, I know that this question has been asked. How do you adjust or make adjustments between what you create for Europe or Germany and what you create in Chile? Um, for example, what uh, the last structure that you showed with I beams and uh, um, hinges that are just locking onto each other. Um, can you use that as an example and explain how you juggle things between these two continents? Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Um, I, I think. I mean, like, um, I would. I would um, connect to the very first project, the wall house for a second, and uh, the last two. When I was showing the wall house project, I was showing a couple of images of a of a series of um, construction members of the construction crew putting up like one of these wall elements, and I, I said something. Um, uh, uh, labor labor is cheap there. And um, for, and that that is like a that is a defining factor of I think of how we would work in that context. For example, if labor is cheap, but uh, infrastructural like certain construction infrastructures are super expensive, that tells you something about how you assemble a building. You think it through from that perspective. That determines the tectonics. It determines the details. It determines the the whole approach to it. A construction such as the one that was showing in Berlin, like with the prefab concrete elements, I think would make quasi no sense in the in the Chilean context. Um, that is a construction economy that is uh, that is based on incredibly high labor cost, um, but where uh, technological infrastructures are um, are easy to get a hold of, meaning large scale cranes that are like relatively cheap at least. So, like, uh, for example, for us here, with the, if I say, hey, one week per floor um, with like only four guys on site, that is like following an economy of construction that is like very German, let's say. While, um, while for example, in a Chilean project, that would be a whole different picture. And I do think, um, uh, I don't think of architecture so much as an image that I'm producing, even though the, the, the result by definition is an image and there is an iconography to the projects. I'm aware I would be lying if there wasn't. Nevertheless, the starting point is a different one. The starting point for me is always like something that is inherent to the ways that architecture comes about, the means of production, the kind of context within and the context to me, it's not just like are the neighboring houses three stories or four stories, but the the, con the context within which we operate as architects is something that is um, truly shaped through kind of environmental conditions, labor, and all of these kinds of things, and that's real. And I do want to um, argue for taking these things serious and letting them drive uh, the architectural production. And I do think that it comes quite natural. Then certain things click and certain things just don't. Certain things kind of coalesce into like something meaningful, and some just stay uh, imagery. I think I, that's. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Um, let's just go through the. There are some comments in the chat. Uh, apart mm -hmm. from brilliant, inspirational, interesting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, there is one question. What about the natural light in the lower floors in the Santiago, the narrow Santiago building? And mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, will there be any greenery at the bottom of this mm -hmm. structure? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's start with the last one. Yes, there is greenery. Um, there is greenery. I, I didn't show that now. Um, but uh, yeah, there's like a whole set of planting. It's like the greenery is also critical um, because the bottom, the bottommost flats are uh, um, um, disability accessible. They're the only ones that are not two story. And that also means that uh, bedrooms are actually on the ground floor, which is like something that you usually try to avoid. And the greenery is actually something that is super critical to create a buffer between the area that is generally accessible and like the to build privacy towards these rooms. So 
I haven't gone into that in detail, um, but uh, due to kind of cutting it to, to, to the gist. But yes, um, and the lower level, the, the, the lighting is actually not so, uh, uh, the, the building is north oriented and um, the north orientation obviously in the Santiago context means like a strong exposure to sunlight. Um, and the issue is actually less on the lower level uh, having enough light than actually uh, controlling and, 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 and cutting down on the light exposure on the upper levels. That And so there is actually a, a, a very basic layer of sun protection. Um, uh, and uh, for example, here in the, in, the, in the German context, that lower level would be something that in that geometric setup you, you wouldn't be able to do, I don't think. I mean, you could build it, but it would be harsh in a sense. Thank you. Um, there is otherwise people um, com compliment you. I love the con brut brutalist concrete, the fact that you deal with the two extremes of architecture. Um, uh, same problems and great solutions, uh, same problems else everywhere and great, great solutions. Um, I have a question. The Chilean social housing project, the, the, the long one, do mm -hmm. the post you said it's initially financed uh, through the state, so so that starts the project. And mm -hmm. um, do people buy into the units before it's built, or who finances yes. actually the building? No, well, the the um, the building is actually financed through the uh, uh, the the social housing agency or Ministry of Social Housing. So there is, I mean, it's a very strange and peculiar setup. The the uh, uh, the future inhabitants are already. Um, are already uh, locked in let's say they have they they have agreed they have signed they have put a certain amount of money down that money a few years ago it was between two and three thousand dollars us dollars roughly or euros so um um that is uh, but that's obviously only a, a relatively limited share of the total cost of construction the units there are roughly I don't want to be wrong, but somewhere around thirty to forty thousand uh, uh, euros per unit in terms of construction. So let's say it's a tenth of it. So that money is has been paid, but I do think it's like more kind of a, 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 a mechanism of commitment uh, that you know that that strengthens commitment. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, the, the the major part of the financing comes from the state, and then um, the inhabitants then uh, basically pay after that initial payment on a kind of monthly or yearly basis, pay down the 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 loan, the the low or no interest loan that they have from the state. Um, I, why I'm asking that is because it's obviously a very particular way of living in such a long, mm -hmm. narrow building that, as mm -hmm. you say, hasn't been done or seen. So the people know, they have seen the design before. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there I is, think I mean, that, actually, that, 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 that shows that they... Yeah. No, I mean, people... Basically, the way it's set up is there's the architects. Um, um, I mean, let's put it that way. Um, there is an, uh, there's an agency um, that that uh, that structures a um, I would put it in quotes right now a participatory project uh, approach or involvement or but in, from a German perspective it's not super participatory it seems more communicative in a way um, so there is an agency that is involved in all of these public housing projects that kind of um, drives let's say the input communication with and coordination of the future users uh, uh, users or owners. Um, and so they have known, uh, they have been known to us and uh, they have known about our project um, for the last five or six years, ever since we started from, you know, we did in like three, four, five interim presentations and discussions with them. Um, I would lie if I would say, hey, it's that that's a full fledged participatory project uh, or process, but it is something where everybody is uh, very, uh, um, as, uh, as long as they show up, they and most of them really do, um, and uh, can ask questions or uh, and so on. So they know about the project and they know what they will, where they will live. So um, it's not something that comes as a total surprise. Okay. And one, then there was another say, Yeah. No, no. Continue, please. One should also say that the normal strategy. This, the no. I mean, um, uh, it is not 
normally a field that architects locally get into very much. I mean, we all know there's a certain, you know, also names uh, that probably are familiar to most of us that have been um, in the Chilean context. But normally uh, the way the procedure works is that um, the town hall um, or the, the, that housing agency, they have in-house uh, an uh, 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 in-house architect in the in the in the ministry. They draw up a scheme. Uh, I, I have seen many of them. I find many of them quite problematic. But nevertheless, they draw something up, and then they ask three construction companies to bid, um, and they have to bid under a certain amount as a cap. And in this case, the only reason why we got into this project was because three construction companies bid based on the scheme that the, that the, this ministry had done themselves and uh, none of the construction companies said like it's feasible it's all too expensive and one of the companies construction companies was someone we'd worked with uh, in the past on a very different project and he said hey um, I mean what do you think can we kind of can we be smart can we do something different so that's how we got in I mean the only ticket we had was um, uh, 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 let's say uh, uh, construction to, to, to lower construction budgets uh, anything that is an architectural ambition there just comes as a strange surplus that nobody's asking for in a way. So uh, we got in there. Uh, we are actually in a very strange way a sub to the contractor, which is like a very unpleasant role to take. But yes. Uh, thanks, Mark. There's Nabil. Uh, that's a new hand, right? Uh, it is, uh, Kiki, if it's OK. I was just thinking about all the housing projects and uh, that this idea of shared space and I think a lot of housing projects are looking at not doing so much of the corridor and more staircases as a way of, um, mm -hmm. of uh, you know removing the corridor or using the street as a way of, of circulating so taking away that institutional but but how do you balance that kind of idea versus the idea of creating common ground shared space where people get mm -hmm. to meet as a community uh, mm -hmm. across your projects well i mean there is there is i mean i can uh, for a second speak of there's a there's a history to that I, I don't know what the correct english term would be but like i would call it like a gallery a circulatory gallery you know and they have been big here in the 70s in the german context but like really in an institutional kind of way of thinking about mass housing so they had a really bad reputation for decades now because they'd also been cut down to the absolute circulatory minimum. Um, so then, you know, a certain approach had been taken, which was like, let's get rid of them. They're absolute taboo. They have been taboo for decades, really. But it's strange to me because I, I actually the problem the problem they posed was not that their existence. The problem was their radical um, uh, uh, cutting down on any sort of qualities other than the minimum dimensions for circulatory needs. So I think to me, the point is not by definition getting rid of them, um, but the, the question is like how to actually make them work and invest into them uh, to, to have a quality of um, that goes beyond pure need of getting from A to B. So they have a social role, they have a, um, the, the extended balconies and so on. So that's kind of um, where I think these different uh, uh, possibilities come in. So. Um, uh, while I'm not, you know, so uh, uh, in, in certain instances, I do think they make very much sense. And then it's a question of how to um, how to literally extend them. So like in the in the Marzahn in the Berlin context, the last project I showed, there was a literal extension to become to turn into these larger balcony pockets. In the case of the Santiago linear social housing building, it was the idea uh, that on that level of the circulation, all the units have a, like uh, these big, uh, these sliding um, facades that you can completely open. So, um, you know, consider these units are super tight. So what if basically your life spatial, the spatial sense uh, actually grows so that this like circulation becomes, you know, almost like a visual extension or also a social extension of your flat. So I do think um, we need to think about these elements not just as a uh, uh, as an infrastructure of circulation, but like as something that um, adds to the units or adds to kind of the the, the, the way inhabitants can 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 um, work with it or you know live with it. Yeah. No. Uh, thank great. you. Uh, thank you. I think if there are no further questions, there was one last question in the chat about parking in the Chilean. Is is there any need for car like like 
do people have cars in, in who live in that social housing project? And how would, would one deal with that? Because it's a big issue here when you mm -hmm. plan without cars and don't park on the street. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a very practical but not unimportant issue to, to think about. Uh, yes, absolutely, and it drives. Um, this project does not provide any parking, um, and uh, that was based on an agreement with the town hall. Um, it is, I mean, an ambition is that, I mean, as, as I started presenting that project, I was pointing to this little map that showed all the social housing projects along the periphery of the metropolitan area. Uh, and I said, like, they need to be closer to technical and social infrastructures. And one key, key one of these social infrastructures is public transport. So the idea generally, and that is like also something that the municipality in Santiago is going along with in instances that you apply for the waiver for parking is if you if you build in a, a immediate proximity to major public transportation, so that the subway system, you can get a waiver for it. So it's an idea. I do think actually, in individual cases, it does pose a challenge. Yes, um, but as a larger uh, strategy for an, uh, as an urban agenda um, to to kind of think of that, think of housing as not just as the four walls and the roof, but as something that is like highly connected to these different infrastructures from subways to schools and so on. I do think it's a, a, a more a, a more a sustainable approach to thinking of that housing. So that's uh, why we don't have to prove. Uh, that's why we don't provide have to provide uh, parking in that scheme. OK, thank you. Um, if there is no further question, I think we can close the session. Thank you again. It was really great to see you and your projects. Uh, thanks for coming to Joburg virtually. Maybe one day, one never knows uh, yes. where, your next, how, where your next project takes you. Um, and our lecture series is 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 this was the find this is the end of it. So um, we are also closing that for this year. Oh, Namdi, yes. Uh, Mark, I want to thank you and Kiki, Nabil, and their colleagues who have joined us. We hope we will see you in 2022. We appreciate your resilience and uh, how you have been with us through the year. Uh, thank you very much in particular. And Mark, thank, once again, thank you for the sharing your work across the continent. It's, it's an exemplary work for our students and our colleagues. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Nabil.